And thanks for joining us. I'm Kent Justice, your host for this week of Jacksonville Business Edition. And this week we're focused on downtown. Joining us is Lori Boyer, the CEO of Downtown Investment Authority in Jacksonville. Uh, and so stated mission of DIA, I wanted to make sure I got this. Downtown Investment Authority seeks to attract investment, facilitate job creation, and increase residential density through capital investment planning, marketing, and public-private partnerships, including the provision of incentives. So Lori Boyer, how does DIA do that? Oh my. Well, <laughs> first of all, we have a very comprehensive plan that was adopted by City Council that spells out everything from capital projects and infrastructure projects that help stimulate that, particular incentive program guidelines to how we measure success and benchmark whether we are, are achieving those goals. So it's all part of you know, it's not winging it as much as right. people may think. Right. Right. <laughs> um, there really is a lot of research that went into development of that, a lot of public input. There were hundreds of, of community meetings on the initial adoption back in 2012, and then it was revised again more recently. So it has a lot of professional expertise that are the underpinnings for yeah. what we do. And just remind people about your professional expertise and why this was a great fit. You were city council president at one point, but on city council for a while before you moved into this role. Yes, so I had the city council background, but I also have a history, um, both as a real estate and land use attorney, and then as a developer. So I've worked in the, yeah. the business side of this as well as the government side, which makes it easier for me when I'm engaging in yeah. conversations with developers who are looking to do business it downtown. It would seem like you understand both, both <laughs> sides of the equation, right? So let's talk about the, the why. What is at stake when it comes to uh, development in downtown Jackson? What's at stake for building up downtown? Well, first you have to recognize the importance of downtown. Like, wh why do you care about downtown? Yeah. So you can care about downtown because of its impact on the tax base. In general, most of the water lines and sewer lines and electric service and infrastructure exists in downtown. There are fire stations nearby. There are public services are close. We've already invested in that. And if we build the residential density or you have that density of commercial office space, they use those existing resources rather than when we build a new subdivision in an area where we don't have any of those services, Certain now scratch. we have to build them all yeah. um, and spend the money for all of that. So, so there's a cost effectiveness to downtown, but more importantly, downtown serve a really important role from the standpoint of recruiting new businesses to Jacksonville, the image of the city, if you're trying to recruit employees, you're trying to you know, create a workforce. And one of the things I always say is that we have a really excellent suburban lifestyle that we can sell to a new college graduate or to someone relocating from some other state. We have a great beach environment and lifestyle. What we don't have where we're really competitive is that urban downtown lifestyle that you see in some other cities. And there are individuals who that's what they're seeking when they're looking to relocate. So we're trying to provide that to be as competitive as possible from an economic development standpoint. Yeah. So our, our episode that came out last week, uh, Jay Gordon from Downtown Vision Inc. was with us. And so talking about some of those things and specifically to who this appeals to and why it needs to be uh, robust and what have you. But 1.5 million people in this J Jacksonville area and, and so uh, downtown as the center point uh, it has to have things that will bring people or have them stay here or move and say, I'm going to live downtown as well, right? Well, and that's been the interesting thing. Downtowns evolve, and ours has. There was a time, you know, decades ago before suburban shopping centers when we had all the retail, big department stores were downtown. And then they more or less moved to the suburbs. We then had all of the big office, not only government offices, but big office towers downtown. Corporate headquarters were downtown. Still many of them are. But that workforce has changed post-COVID as more people work from a hybrid perspective or mm -hmm. remotely. Yeah. And then what you've seen in the last two decades is this movement to really developing residential populations in downtown. Some place like St. Pete, for example, has what they call a reverse commute, meaning there are more people who live downtown and work out in the suburbs 
than people who live in the suburbs and come downtown to work. And what we're really striving to do is backfill that residential population. That creates demand for retail services, for restaurants, for, for shopping. Um, they will not come to downtown if all we have are people who work in offices that kind of drive in their parking garage, go into their office and then leave and never really get out on the street or have a chance to have dinner downtown. Yeah. And we can't survive just on you know, select sporting events on certain days. We have to have a 365 day a year downtown. Yeah, that, and that is a daunting task, it seems like. Uh, and so this research I've done is that the daytime population of Jacksonville, downtown is like 56,000, does that sound about right? 56,000 is the number that is reported of workers downtown. Um, I don't know if Jake Gordon spoke to this, but one of the things they do is collect Placer AI data that keeps track of where your cell phone goes, and not by your name but they can document that we are back to pre-2019 presence on the street. The number of people okay. walking on the street at lunchtime or other places is back to pre-COVID numbers, which is great, even with that hybrid workforce that we've mentioned. We've now kind of surpassed it. And, and we had heard for a while, hey, the goal is 10,000 people who live downtown. As I understand it, we haven't reached that yet, but trending. I mean, it's 7,500 people yeah, who are living downtown. We're or probably at 7,800 right okay. now. I have a thousand residential units under construction right now that will be delivering within the next six or nine months. Some of them in the next two or three months, and that would bring that population very close to the 10,000 number. But we've moved the target now, and we're now looking at 15. And really, if I look at what I have, what I call in the pipeline, projects that have, are in design, are in permitting, are in review, we have probably another 2,000 units that are in that stage. I definitely wanted to talk about that. Um, and, and we had reported just this week, Downtown Development Review Board granted some conceptual design approval for the lofts at the South Bank apartment. So this just, it caught up to me. I'm like, oh, there are things happening. Let's talk with Lori Boyer about this. Uh, and this project specifically is gonna have affordable housing, retail space, storage units. So maybe you can talk more about other things that are in the pipeline and, and maybe an explainer on Downtown Development Review Board as opposed to what the Downtown Investment Authority is. Okay, a lot of questions in that. I, that's true. <laughs> We've got time, let's do it. One so, at a time. <laughs> so first of all, um, what is downtown? Let's start with that because when, you say, when I say there's a thousand units under construction in downtown, downtown goes all the way to I-95 where Brooklyn is included, South Bank is included, as you mentioned, includes the sports entertainment district, and many people think of downtown as just that city center core area, uh, but it's not. So South Bank, as you mentioned, we just approved at Downtown Development Review Board. So Downtown Development Review Board is essentially the planning agency, the planning commission for downtown, and it has a, a bit of a, it has a downtown zoning overlay that it administers. So it's looking more at architectural design features in order to comply with the zoning overlay. Downtown Investment Authority is where we evaluate economic development proposals, job creation, incentives. We do the master planning for downtown. We do capital investments in parks and roadway improvements and things like that. So we have a much broader role. Theirs is very specific to reviewing particular projects for consistency with the overlay. Okay. Uh, part of DIA, no, it sounds like it's separate, but you've got to work closely, right? Staff is overlapping. Okay. So the staff work for us. Okay. And if there were an appeal from Downtown Development Review Board, it appeals to DIA. Most of those decisions would appeal up to DIA, but it's a separately appointed board. Okay. So I, and I had started this conversation talking about this uh, specific project lofts at the South Bank apartment. So. Uh, that's something that, again, is more of the details there rather than the master plan that you're talking about from DIA. So, correct. And in this case, that's the project that was controversial when it was going through the zoning process. The DIA had actually at one point recommended against the project because it did not want the self-storage units from a master plan standpoint. 
and eventually it was combined with a residential development and approved by DDRB and City Council. What's the exact location on that? I've got the, a general idea, but... Uh, the corner of Hendricks and Prudential. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, and when we were reporting on that this week, um, there's a restaurant in that area, and it's right down the street from another restaurant. So, oh, boy. The, when you have development, it, it changes what's already there. So you've got to be thinking about how does this impact a, a broader uh, area, right? Well, our view from a master plan standpoint was simply that that's a really important intersection on the South yeah. Bank. Yeah, um, good it's, point. You know, very visible, very critical to traffic, leads you right to the Riverwalk and River Place Boulevard. And so we were really looking for it to, we didn't want the self-storage. Now that they've added the residential and they have the retail, it's certainly much more desirable than it was as initially presented. And not that self-storage is a bad use or offensive in some way, simply that it doesn't create any vibrancy, right? People bring furniture and leave it there, and there's yeah. no activity to speak of right. other than drop-off. Yeah. So we were looking for things that um, created a living environment or a work environment, and we have that now. Well, so uh, beyond that, um, what are some of the other things that are coming or are headed this way as you look into the pipeline? So let's talk South Bank first, sure. since you've started there. So we have those units, and I'm gonna call those my pipeline units. Those aren't the under construction. And right across the street from the station here, you have yeah. Artia, which I'm sure you see all the time. Which... Only when driving in and out of my workplace, <laughs> five days a week, yes. Which yeah. is well underway, and it's part of the thousand units that I say that will deliver in the next year um, and become available for occupancy, and it's market rate. We have Toll Brothers townhomes that are under construction at River's Edge, which is that former Southside generating station site, and we have all the parks there under construction. The roads are already completed. There's about four acres of parks that are due to be completed by December of this year, going into the spring. Riverwalk connects the whole thing. There is also the related project, which is a high rise next to the Acosta Bridge that is now going through city council, has already been through our board and they're in the design process. So those are just a few. There are several others on the drawing board that I'm not yeah. really at liberty to say, right. but that's not, just- Not at that point yet. You can right, that's just it. South Bank. And then we can kind of do that everywhere downtown, Brooklyn, Sports and Entertainment, Doro is getting back under construction. They hope by August or September, they're filed with legislation before council. We have Union Terminal Building, which is a historic restoration in sports and entertainment that's nearing completion. So pick the part of downtown yeah. and I can give you a few examples of both public projects and these private investments. Well, I was gonna ask about the what the level of investment in downtown has been over the last three years. Just looking at this, I, I read, and I think it was even from your website there, but since the beginning of 2021, $500 million in projects have been completed and then there's another billion dollars in project under construction. Does that sound accurate? Actually, and I think our current number is that we have more than two billion under construction right now. And yeah, it's an enormous number, but that's just because there, there is a lot. And I think one of the challenges for your audience, members of the public in general, is the amount of time it takes from the time something is initially envisioned yeah. and you see the rendering and, and it's approved to the time it actually delivers. Yeah. Uh, that's maybe three years, um, sometimes longer than that. And it, it's a long runway. So when Come you say on, under construction. We're all impatient these days. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Microwave society, right? Yeah, why isn't it done already? We, we do know that there's a, a lengthy list of some, some recently completed projects. Uh, Ashley Street Container Lofts, uh, the Ashley Square Senior Housing, Florida Baptist Convention Center Building, Elena Flats Lofts at Brooklyn, Jefferson Station, uh, a, a number of these things that you can look at and say, oh, okay, development has happened and not just underway and not just we've got some renderings. So I, I wanna to get to uh, something here. City Council created a, a special committee what they called on the future of downtown, chaired by Kevin Carrico, the, now the vice president of the city council. Well, what's your view on that? And what do you anticipate, I guess, coming out of that where it pertains to DIA? So actually we kind of view it as an opportunity. Um, in part, we have 
this council is not brand new, but they've only many of the members no. have only been there a year, and they weren't around when the plan was amended last. So it's an opportunity for them to really learn about what we are doing and what the successes are that we have achieved, and also what our challenges are and what the opportunities are. And part of what we're hearing from them is some desire to see maybe something done differently. So for example, there have been voice, I've heard several people voice the idea they'd like to see us concentrate on that city center core area. So we're exploring as a board, what does that mean? What yeah. does concentrate mean? Does that mean that you give a greater incentive there and a lesser incentive if you're not in that area or you only work in that area or exactly how do you how do you implement that concept so we have a couple ideas and we'll be presenting to the committee on that yeah uh, offensive at all did it feel like an attack on dia to have this special committee say we're going to look at what you're doing or was it a hey we're okay with this this is just simple review our processes and how do we get better? I would say the Twitter dialogue and some of the social media dialogue <laughs> went offensive, um, as it is prone to do. That might happen <laughs> on social media, yes. Um, however, what I've heard from the actual council members, what I've heard in the meetings, and I think there are some really productive opportunities that can come from it. So in that regard, it is, it's one more thing on our plate to prepare for and work toward getting a, and shifting direction takes some time whenever you do that. How would you change program guidelines? But I also think it's warranted because two things are colliding, if you will. Number one is that tax revenue came in lower this year. You heard the mayor's budget right. proposal. Our, our budget is a little more stressed than it has been the last two years. And then at the same time, we're seeing the development community looking for these completion grants and larger incentives to fill a financial gap. So I think it's a good time to look at how we prioritize those. Yeah. We can't possibly do them all. As a former council member, I kind of look at, look at special committees as an opportunity to dig a little deeper in something. Yeah. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper on this. It was a pain point for a long time. The Berkman Two Tower, I mean, that was a tragedy when, when the collapse happened there. And then subsequently, it was an eyesore in downtown for more than a decade, finally imploded two years ago. Uh, and then this week, we saw that the property on Bay Street was auctioned off. Now, is this something that you'd anticipate coming into view of DIA? Is there gonna be somebody, because that's some prime real estate, right? Uh, where someone is gonna come forward with a plan and say, hmm, we need to develop here. Um, I do anticipate that. Yeah. I don't know. I, all the media reporting I heard was that it was a closed bid, and I have not yet heard who won the auction. But I know that I was sending it out to any number of developers mm. who had expressed interest. Every time I heard a new sale date scheduled, it was I was sharing with them so that they could prepare for it and participate. So I knew some people interested that had some really great ideas for the site, and I hope one of them was the successful bidder. Yeah, well, it, it does make a difference when, like, finally something happens there. Uh, two years ago when the implosion happened, like, finally something will happen Well, that there. set the stage for the next right. yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Maybe the last thing I wanted to talk, well, two other things. I wanted to talk about Laura Street Trio. That's something that we were on our, our podcast before talking about. And uh, most recently, um, we understand that Steve Atkins, who owns that property, had been trying to develop this for 10 years or something. Seems like that has come to an end. Where does that stand? What's kind of the final word on the proposals that we've seen for the Laura Street Trio so far? Um, I wouldn't, I think it would be an overstatement to say that it's come to an end if okay. you ask Mr. Atkins. Okay, good. Um, because he really hopes to still pursue it with city council. So, but from DIA's perspective, we have probably spent a, the majority of time on that project over the last three years and looked at many variations of ways to finance it or ways to make it work. What our board's position was is unless there is a major change in structure and the financial proposal, we can't move forward. We think neither the financial asks nor the structure that's being proposed are viable. So that was the position our board took. There is legislation currently pending before city council that Councilman Carlucci, Matt Carlucci, had introduced. And so it's totally appropriate for the special committee to 
take up that legislation, consider it in light of our resolution, take whatever action they feel appropriate, or introduce other legislation. So regardless of DIA's board coming back and saying, we, we don't think this is a great idea, we're not going to support this, council can still say, we do think it's a good idea and we'll support it financially. They certainly have the ability to do that. I mean, they have the authority to make that decision if they want to. We're happy to share why we analyzed it the way we did. Um, we also suggested acquiring the property or we, we had a number of other scenarios that would allow it. Please don't misunderstand the fact that we think it's an important building and set of buildings right. in downtown and would love to see them restored. Okay. Uh, the other thing, I know we were talking about South Bank, but what about North Bank? And I'm thinking the shipyards area, uh, we've got uh, museums moving over there. Uh, what does that look like right now and in the near future? I don't think it's as short term as Riverfront Plaza and what you're seeing with the Riverwalk and the new bulkheads and the Performing Arts Center addition. There was a news article maybe a week ago, there were a press release that went out about all the Riverwalk closures. We ask everyone to be patient with us because right. that just means things are under construction. Right. Yeah. McCoy's Good Creek point. is finally being reconstructed. The Emerald Trail link will come through there. We won't be flooding out all of McCoy's Creek Boulevard. So there's a lot of good things going on. The shipyards area that you mentioned is specifically, that starts with Berkman too. Then you um, have Shipyards West Park that is nearing design completion. It's a park, so the Parks Department manages that part of the project. Immediately next to that, you have Hogan's Creek that the Emerald Trail Groundworks won the big grant to help work mm -hmm. on that project. Then you have Mosh. Then you kind of roll right into the Four Seasons that's under construction and the new stadium deal. So our mantra these days is downtown is under construction. It's under construction. Um, and that's, that's, I think, part of what people are wondering. And one of the wonderful things about getting to do this podcast with you is to ask about some of those things. Um, where do people go if they want to find out more about what is under construction or what the DIA is working on right now? So I might suggest the Invest Jacks website okay. that we partner on with Downtown Vision. Of course, you can go to the dia.coj.net website. Our website's a little dry. Um, and we're trying to make it a little bit more user-friendly, which you might see in the next few months, put some additional data points and dashboards and metrics on it, uh, as well as graphics. But the InvestJax website has much of that information right now. Lori Boyer, I appreciate it very much. CEO Thank of you. Downtown Investment Authority. And if you missed last week's episode, you're going to want to check that out as well. Jake Gordon from Downtown Vision Inc. spending time with us as these couple of weeks we've been talking about uh, downtown in Jacksonville. Hey, new episodes drop every Thursday at 9 a.m. Thanks so much for joining us for this week in Jacksonville Business Edition.